Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to our audiobook theater. I am your host Keith, man of letters here to bring you knowledge, information, and hopefully at the very least a bit of entertainment. Today we are reading the Gospel according to Mary Magdalene. We will be reading a foreword by the Dr. Karen King and commentary uh, without which understanding the gospel as it's written verbatim is almost impossible to someone who doesn't study the Gnostic texts. So we will go over that first. Let us begin with the archive notes. The Gospel of Mary is found in the Berlin Gnostic Codex. This very important and well-preserved codex was discovered in the late 19th century somewhere near Akhmin in Upper Egypt. It was purchased in Cairo in 1896 by a German scholar, Dr. Karl Reinhardt, and then taken to Berlin. The codex, as these ancient books are called, was probably copied and bound in the late 4th or early 5th century. It contains Coptic translations of three very important early Christian Gnostic texts, the Gospel of Mary, the Apocryphon of John, and the Sophia of Jesus Christ. The texts themselves date to the second century and were originally authored in Greek. Despite the importance of the discovery of this ancient collection of Gnostic scriptures, Several misfortunes, including two world wars, delayed its publication until 1955. By then, the large Nag Hammadi collection of ancient Gnostic writings had also been recovered. It was found that copies of two of the texts in this codex, the Apocryphon of John and the Sophia of Jesus Christ, had already been preserved in the Nag Hammadi collection. These texts from the Berlin Gnostic Codex were used to aid and augment translations of the Apocryphon of John and the Sophia of Jesus Christ, as they are now published in the Nag Hammadi Library. But more importantly, the Codex preserves the most complete surviving fragments of the Gospel of Mary, and it is clear this named Mary is the person we call Mary of Magdala. Two other small fragments of the Gospel of Mary from separate Greek editions were later unearthed in archaeological excavations at Oxyhynchus, Egypt. Fragments of the Gospel of Thomas were also found at this ancient site. Finding three fragments of a text of this antiquity is extremely unusual, and it is thus evidenced that the Gospel of Mary was well distributed in early Christian times and existed in both an original Greek and Coptic language translation. Unfortunately, the surviving manuscript of the Gospel of Mary is missing pages 1 to 6 and pages 11 to 14, pages that included sections of the text up to chapter 4 and portions of chapter 5 to 8. The extant text of the Gospel of Mary, as found in the Berlin Gnostic Codex, is presented below. The manuscript text begins on page 7, in the middle of a passage. So we will continue with an explanation of the background material. The explanation is presented by Karen King goes as follows. Early Christianity and the Gospel of Mary by Dr. Karen L. King. Few people today are acquainted with the Gospel of Mary. Written early in the second century CE, it disappeared over 1500 years until a single fragmentary copy in Coptic translation came to light in the late 19th century. Although details of the discovery itself are obscure, we do know that the 5th century manuscript in which it was inscribed was purchased in Cairo by Karl Reinhardt and brought to Berlin in 1896. Two additional fragments in Greek have come to light in the 20th century, yet still no complete copy of the Gospel of Mary is known. Fewer than eight pages of the ancient papyrus text survive, which means that about half of the Gospel of Mary is lost to us perhaps forever. Yet these scant pages provide an intriguing glimpse into a kind of Christianity lost for almost 1,500 years. 
This astonishingly brief narrative presents a radical interpretation of Jesus' teachings as a path to inner spiritual knowledge. It rejects his suffering and death as the path to eternal life. It exposes the erroneous view that Mary of Magdala was a prostitute for what it is, a piece of theological fiction. It presents the most straightforward and convincing argument in an early Christian writing for the legitimacy of women's leadership. It offers a sharp critique of illegitimate power and a utopian vision of spiritual perfection. It challenges our rather romantic views about the harmony and unanimity of the first Christians, and it asks us to rethink the basis for church authority, all written in the name of a woman. The story of the Gospel of Mary is a simple one. Since the first six pages are lost, the Gospel opens in the middle of a scene portraying a discussion between the Savior and his disciples set after the resurrection. The Savior is answering their questions about the end of the material world and the nature of sin. He teaches them that at present all things, whether material or spiritual, are interwoven with each other. In the end, that will not be so. Each nature will be turned to its own root, its own original state and destiny. But meanwhile, the nature of sin is tied to the nature of life. People sin because they do not recognize their own spiritual nature and instead love the lower nature that deceives them and leads to disease and death. Salvation is achieved by discovering within oneself the true spiritual nature of humanity and overcoming the deceptive entrapments of the bodily passions and the world. The Savior concludes this teaching with a warning against those who would delude the disciples into following some heroic leader or a set of rules and laws. Instead, they are to seek the child of true humanity within themselves and gain inward peace. After commissioning them to go forth and preach the gospel, the Savior departs. But the disciples do not go out joyfully to preach the gospel. Instead, controversy erupts. All the disciples, except Mary, have failed to comprehend the Savior's teaching. Rather than seek peace within, they are distraught, frightened. Frightened that if they follow his commission to preach the gospel, they might share his agonizing fate. Mary steps in and comforts them, and, at Peter's, relates teachings unknown to them that she had received from the Savior in a vision. The Savior had explained to her the nature of prophecy and the rise of the soul to its final rest describing how to win the battle against the wicked, illegitimate powers that seek to keep the soul entrapped in the world and ignorant of its true spiritual nature. But as she finishes her account, two of the disciples quite unexpectedly challenge her. Andrew objects that her teaching is strange and he refuses to believe that it came from the Savior. Peter goes forth to deny her denying that Jesus would ever have given this kind of advanced teaching to a woman, or that Jesus could possibly have preferred her to them. Apparently, when he asked her to speak, Peter had not expected such elevated teaching, and now he questioned her character, implying that she has lied about having received special teaching in order to increase her stature among the disciples. Severely taken aback, Mary begins to cry at Peter's accusation. Levi comes quickly to her defense, pointing out to Peter that he is a notorious hothead, and now he is treating Mary as though she were the enemy. We should be ashamed of ourselves. He admonishes them all. Instead of arguing amongst ourselves, we should go out and preach the gospel as the Savior commanded us. The story ends here, but the controversy is far from resolved. Andrew and Peter at last, and likely the other fearful disciples as well, have not understood the Savior's teachings and are offended by Jesus' apparent preference of a woman over them. Their limited understanding and false pride make it impossible for them to comprehend the truth of the Savior's teaching. 
The reader must both wonder and worry what kind of gospel such proud and ignorant disciples will preach. How are we to understand this story? It is at once reminiscent of the New Testament gospels and yet clearly different from them. The gospel's characters, the Savior, Mary, Peter, Andrew, and Levi, are familiar to those acquainted with the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, too, is the theological language of gospel and kingdom, as well as such sayings of Jesus as, those who seek will find, or anyone with two ears should listen. And the New Testament Gospels and Acts repeatedly mention the appearance of Jesus to his disciples after the resurrection. Yet, it is also clear that the story of the Gospel of Mary differs in significant respects. For example, after Jesus commissions the disciples, they do not go out joyfully to preach the Gospel as they do in Matthew. Instead, they weep, fearing for their lives. Some of the teachings also seem shocking coming from Jesus, especially his assertion that there is no such thing as sin. Modern readers may well find themselves sympathizing with Andrew's assessment that these teachings are strange ideas. The Gospel of Mary was written when Christianity, still in its nascent stages, was made up of committees widely dispersed around the Eastern Mediterranean. Communities which were often relatively isolated from one another and probably each small enough to meet in someone's home without attracting too much noise. Although writings appeared early, especially letters addressing the concerns of local churches, collections containing Jesus' sayings and narratives interpreting his death and resurrection Oral practices dominated the lives of early Christians. Preaching, teaching, and rituals of table fellowship and baptism were the core of the Christian experience. What written documents they had served at most as supplemental guides to preaching and practice. Nor can we assume that the various churches all possessed the same documents. After all, these are the people who wrote the first Christian literature. Christoph Marxi suggests that we have lost 85% of Christian literature from the first two centuries, and that includes only the literature we know about. Surely there must be even more, for the discovery of the texts like the Gospel of Mary came as a complete surprise. We have to be careful that we don't suppose it is possible to reconstruct the whole of early Christian history and practice out of the few texts that survive our picture will always be partial. Not only because so much is lost, but because early Christian practices were so little and tied to durable writing. Partly as a consequence of their independent development and differing situation, these churches sometimes diverged widely in their perspectives on essential elements of Christian belief and Christian practice. Such basic issues as the content and meaning of Jesus' teachings, the nature of salvation, the value of prophetic authority, and the roles of women and slaves came under intense debate. Early Christians proposed and experimented with competing visions of ideal community. It is important to remember, too, that these first Christians had no New Testament, no Nicene Creed or Apostles' Creed, no commonly established church order or chain of authority, no church buildings, and indeed no single understanding of Jesus. All of the elements we might consider to be essential to define Christianity did not yet exist. Far from being starting points, the Nicene Creed and the New Testament were the end products of these debates and disputes. They represent the distillation of experience and experimentation and not a small amount of strife and struggle. All early Christian literature bears traces of these controversies. The earliest surviving documents of Christianity, the letters of Paul, show that considerable difference of opinion existed about such issues as circumcision and the Jewish food laws or the relative value of spiritual gifts, 
These and other such contentious issues as whether the resurrection was physical or spiritual were stimulating theological conversations and causing rifts within and among Christian groups. By the time of the Gospel of Mary, these discussions were becoming increasingly nuanced and more polarized. History, as we know, is written by the winners. In the case of early Christianity, this meant that many voices in these debates were silenced through repression or neglect. The Gospel of Mary, along with other newly discovered works from the earliest Christian period, increases our knowledge of the enormous diversity and dynamic character of the process by which Christianity was shaped. The goal of this volume is to let 21st century readers hear one of those voices not in order to drown out the voices of canon and tradition, but in order that they might be heard with the greater clarity that comes with a broadened historical perspective. Whether or not the message of the Gospel of Mary should be embraced is a matter readers will decide for themselves. And thus ends the foreword of the Gospel of Mary of Magdala, uh, the excerpt by Karen L. King, Pole Bridge Press, Santa Rosa, California, 2003. And now we begin the translation of the Gospel according to Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Mary. Pages 1 to 6 of the manuscript, containing 1 to 3, are lost. And the extent starts on page 7. Chapter 4 Will matter then be destroyed or not? The Savior said, All nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. For the nature of matter is resolved into the roots of its own nature alone. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Peter said to him, since you have explained everything to us, tell us this also. What is the sin of the world? The Savior said, There is no sin, but it is you who make sin when you do the things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. That is why the good came into your midst, to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its root. Then he continued and said, this is why you become sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. He who has a mind to understand, let him understand. Matter gave birth to a passion that has no equal, which proceeded from something contrary to nature. Then there arises a disturbance in its whole body. That is why I said to you, be of good courage. And if you are discouraged, be encouraged in the presence of the different forms of nature. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When the Blessed One had said this, he greeted them all, saying, Peace be with you. Receive my peace unto yourselves. Beware that no one lead you astray, saying, Lo here, or lo there, for the Son of Man is within you follow after him. Those who seek him will find him. Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you, and do not give a law like the lawgiver, lest you be constrained by it. When he said this, he departed. Chapter 5 But they were grieved. They wept greatly, saying, How shall we go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man if they do not spare him? How will they spare us? Then Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, Do not weep, and do not grieve, nor be irresolute. For his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you. But rather, let us praise his greatness, 
for he has prepared us and made us into men. When Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good, and they began to discuss the words of the Savior. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women. Tell us the words of the Savior, which you remember, which you know, but we do not, nor have we heard. Mary answered them and said, What is hidden from you, I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak to them these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision, and I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. He answered and said to me, Blessed are you that you did not waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there is the treasure. I said to him, Lord, how does he who sees the vision see it? Through the soul or through the spirit? The Savior answered and said, He does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, but the mind that is between the two, that is what sees the vision and it is. And then pages 11 through 14 are missing from the manuscript. Chapter 8 ends dot 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 it. Verse 10. And desire said, I did not see you descending, but now I see you ascending. Why do you lie since you belong to me? The soul answered and said, I saw you. You did not see me nor recognize me. I served you as a garment, and you did not know me. When it said this, it, the soul, went away rejoicing greatly. Again it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. The power questioned the soul, saying, Where are you going? In wickedness are you bound, but you are bound. Do not judge. And the soul said, Why do you judge me? Although I have not judged. I was bound, though I have not bound. I was recognized, but I have recognized that the all is being dissolved, both the earthly things and the heavenly. When the soul had overcome the third power, it went upwards and saw the fourth power, which took seven forms. The first form is darkness, the second, desire, the third, ignorance, the fourth, is the excitement of death. The fifth is the kingdom of the flesh. The sixth is the foolish wisdom of flesh. The seventh is the wrathful wisdom. These are the seven powers of wrath. They asked the soul, Whence do you come, slayer of men? Or where are you going, conqueror of space? The soul answered and said, What binds me has been slain and what churns me about has been overcome, and my desire has been ended, and ignorance has died. In an eon I was released from a world, and in a type from a type, and from the fetter of oblivion which is transient. From this time on will I attain to the rest of time, of the season, of the eon. In Silence Chapter 9 when Mary had said this, she fell silent, since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her. But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, Say what you wish to say about what he has said. I, at least, do not believe that the Savior said this, for certainly these teachings are strange ideas. Peter answered and spoke concerning these same things. He questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what do you think? Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have thought this up myself in my heart, or that I am lying about the Savior? 
Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot-tempered. Now I see you contending against the woman like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Rather let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man, and separate as he has commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law being what the Savior said. And when they heard this, they began to go forth to proclaim and to preach the Gospel of Mary.